We are in a series right now called Win at Home, and we're, we've been talking last week, we kicked it off and really just kind of shared the premise of why I'm doing this series in the first place. God wants you to win at home, the enemy wants you to lose at home, and we all need help. That's really the premise of it. Um, God wants you to win, the enemy wants you to lose, we all need help. Everybody in here needs help, whether you're a sibling, whether you're a parent, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're an empty nester, whether you're a single person, you're like, I, I live at home by myself, you still need help, okay? So we all need some help in some way. Today's message is going to be very, very um, poignant for where we are as a culture, but also it's gonna be very, very timely for, I think, anybody that's in this room, whether you're a child, a teenager, young adult, um, grandparents, all of us can work in this area. And I want us to go to uh, our theme verses found in Proverbs chapter four, um, it's, uh, 24, sorry, and it says this. I want everybody, everybody to come in with me. Let's do this together. It says this, it, it takes what? Wisdom. Come on, let's say it 930. Let's say it like we mean it. It takes? Wisdom. Come on, if you're, if you're watching online, put wisdom in the chat. It takes some wisdom to have a good family. You wanna have a good family? I think everybody in here wants to have a good family. Nobody wants to have a fighting family or a bad family. It's gonna take some wisdom to do it, and it's also gonna take some understanding. These are kind of the key ingredients for a great marriage, a great family, great relationships, wisdom and understanding in order to make it strong. And so last week, we defined what wisdom is. Wisdom is truth applied to your life. Um, it's a difference between knowledge. Knowledge is you know a lot. Wisdom is you do a lot. So there's a lot of people who are knowledgeable, but not wise. I know what I should do. There's a lot of Christians who know what they should do. They just got a problem between knowing it and doing it. Okay, so if we want to win at home, it's, it's, it's not enough to just have a bunch of knowledge and know what we should be doing in our home. We need it to become a revelation which then becomes an activation, which then becomes transformation in your life. Can I get an amen from anybody amen. in the room? Okay, so that's what we wanna do. So today I wanna talk to you about uh, one thing that I think is crucial to winning at home. Let me put it this way. If you get this right, you've got a really good chance to win in your home. If you get this wrong, you're gonna lose. Guaranteed, you will lose. And so this is how crucial this is. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share what I think are some crucial foundational bedrocks in, in our home to get right. So for all of our note takers, all right, you ready? Well, I'm gonna give you the first big thought right out the gate today, and that is this. And this is really kind of the big idea for today's message, and that is this. You can't get relationships right if you get words wrong. You can't get relationships right if you get words wrong. You gotta get your words right if you wanna win in your relationship. So let's go to scripture. There's gonna be a ton of scripture. I'm just gonna go ahead and let y'all know we're gonna let the Bible do a lot of the talking today and allow God's word. Yet again, that's what this whole series is built around, letting God's word help us understand what's key for our family. So I love how the message translation shares Matthew 12, 37, and it says this. Everybody help me here. It says, words are what? Powerful. Come on, they're powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Words can build. Words can destroy. Words can help. Words can hurt. Words, take them seriously. They're incredibly powerful when they come out of our mouth. We've got to make sure that we get this right. There is a lie that gets infiltrated into our culture that says this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Words will never hurt me. How many of y'all know that is the farthest from the truth? Amen. I literally know people who have been physically abused in relationships, and they've gotten over that a lot quicker than people who have been emotionally and verbally abused. There's some of you right now, you're still going through counseling based off of what your daddy said when you were 12. There's some of us that are going through counseling based off of the words that weren't spoken to us, that we didn't hear, I love you. We didn't hear, I'm proud of you. We didn't hear, and, and, and yet, we, we get so loose with our tongue, we just say what comes out of our, our, out of our, of our thoughts, and we, just, we, we don't realize these words are so powerful. You've got to make sure that you incredibly take them seriously. Now, think about this for a moment, though. We have so many ways to communicate nowadays. We're in 2023. You can communicate with anybody, someone across the street or someone literally across the world. I can text message 
I can Facebook, I can TikTok, I can group me. Man, I got so many apps on my phone for community. WhatsApp, I mean, I've got so many. FaceTime. Think about this. We have so many ways to communicate, and yet we're terrible communicators. If you like, think about that for a moment. Like, we can talk, we can talk to anybody. We've got way too many avenues to talk to people, and yet we can't talk to people. It's like, it's like an oxymoron. Like, we have all these avenues to have these communications. And how many know, if you want to be in relationships, you got to communicate? Okay, let me help you out. If you're single in here, if you want to date, you got to communicate. <laughs> got to like say, will you go out with me? <laughs> like, will you, how many know these words have to come out? Like you've, you've got to speak. Hey, how many know if you want to get married, there's a proposal. You've got to communicate. You just can't be like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like you got to. You got to say something, okay? When you get up here on the, on the stage for your wedding day, you've got to communicate. You've got to, I do, okay? It's real simple for you. I've got to do most of the communicating, but for you, I do, okay? And if you want to keep a marriage, you've got to communicate. If you want to raise the level of intimacy in any relationship, you've got to communicate. If you want to resolve conflict, you've got to you want to get a raise, you've got to work. Okay, yes. <laughs> Go show up, okay? Do your job. You got to communicate. So let me, let me give us a, a, a working thing for communication. Why communication is so vital? Here's the craziest part. Watch this. The craziest part is we know this. <laughs> I'm literally not saying anything to y'all that you're like, that's new. <laughs> so here we go. What blood is to the body communication is to relationships. So think about this. Your blood in your body is designed by God to be a, a highway of nutrients and, and, and oxygen to every part of your body, from your toes to your head to your brain. Your brain doesn't get blood. It ain't good. I don't know if you've ever had something or maybe you've had family members where the blood wasn't getting fully oxygenated properly. It's not good. Or the blood didn't make it to a certain appendage. They will cut that foot off. Like where there's no blood, there's death. And where there's no communication, there's death. You desperately need communication to be able to foster life-giving, joy-filled relationships. Now, notice something. I'm using this word communication because it's not that we don't talk. We talk, we just don't communicate. There's a difference. Talking is you just said a bunch of words. Communicating is you gained understanding. And there's a lot of marriages, there's a lot of relationships, there's a lot of workplaces where everybody's talking, but nobody's communicating. Because you walk out of a situation going, I don't know what just happened. And watch, and most arguments, most arguments happen because there's been a misunderstanding or there's been miscommunication. Now let me define them for you. you. If you like taking notes, this will help you. Misunderstanding is you heard it wrong. Miscommunication is you said it wrong. And how many know we've had all those? Y'all, y'all, ever, y'all ever called somebody or, man, the worst is you text somebody and they took it the whole wrong way? You're like, I didn't say that. You're like, yeah, you did. You're like, but I didn't say it that way. I was just saying like, how are you? No, you were like, how are you? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. I was just asking. It's just a simple question. I want to know. Like, it's not just what you hear, it's, it's how you hear it. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit more in just, in just a little bit, but it's so vital for us. And so the goal of communication is not agreement. The goal of communication is understanding. I need to understand you. I need to understand what you're trying to say. Now, if you've ever been in another country and they literally speak a different language, and you're having a hard time understanding. And so like you're using, you know, 
sign language and international sign languages for, you know, I got to eat. Like, where do I, can I go to the bathroom? Like, you're trying to, because you're trying to communicate. You're talking, they're talking, but no one's understanding. That's most marriages. That's literally most marriages. There's a lot of talking. Nobody's understanding each other. So today I want us to, I want to help you gain some understanding, gain some wins in the area of communication because it's essential and vital life skill that we've all got to develop if we want to win in our home. So I don't think there's anyone better to talk to us about communication and talking and speaking than Jesus himself. But if there's a second best, it would be Jesus' brother, James. Now, I don't know if y'all knew this. Jesus had a brother. Jesus had siblings. Some people don't believe that, but he did. He had siblings. James was one of them. James wrote a book. Guess what he called it? James. Selfish, man. Okay, James. <laughs> called it after himself. Um, but he, he's got a book named after him. He's the brother. First off, can we just go ahead and just state the obvious? How hard would it be to be the brother of Jesus? You know, when your parents are like, I just wish you'd be like your brother. <laughs> like, I mean, no, you, you think your, your, your siblings are hard to live up to. Think about Jesus. Brother's never sick. He always speaks life to everybody. He even raises people from the dead. What do you do? I don't, I don't know. I guess not much. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> or like you're faking sick. You know, that'd be the hilarious part. You're faking sick for school and your brother comes by. You're healed in Jesus' name. Dang, no. Oh, not again. <laughs> Let me be sick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> How many of y'all have that brother, they, brother or sister, they wouldn't let you get away with anything. Like you do something behind the scenes your parents never knew and they were the rat. They were like the, hey, mom, listen, let, mom. How many you know that's Jesus? But the crazy thing, Jesus knew that his thoughts. He'd be like, mom, can I tell you what James thought? I'm gonna tell you. So this is a hard situation, okay? Just letting y'all know. All right, so James 3 is the longest teaching on the tongue, in scripture, it's the longest one. Uh, there's a lot of teaching on the tongue. Jesus did a lot of teaching. Uh, King Solomon in the book of Proverbs has a ton of teaching on the tongue, but this is the longest all in one little stretch. So James chapter three, verse one, you go, you can read through it all. We're not gonna read through the whole thing, but I wanna I want read, want read a section of it that I think is applicable to us today. And it says this, in the same way, the tongue is what? Small. Come on, say it again, it's a what? It's a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. All right, look how it just describes this tongue of ours. It, you can go back, you can go to the next one. It says, it is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. Here we go, watch this. It can set your whole life on fire. I don't even have to preach this because you know this. Like, you know what your tongue has gotten you into. Literally, it says, like, in a moment, sets a blaze. Your whole life is on fire based off of something that you've said. There have been relationships that have just been destroyed based off of one comment, one conversation. Some of you don't talk to your family member because of one conversation or maybe multiple conversations but that word, those words have destroyed that. Some of you have, have literally had to work hard to restore things because your, your words, your tongue has gotten you into some trouble. And this, this scripture is telling us, here's why it is. For it's, it's set on fire by hell itself. That our tongue is literally backed by hell. The enemy is so after your tongue, so after this, this little life right here. That's what it is. All right? Now watch. Watch the rest of this verse. People can tame all kinds of animals. They can tame birds, iguanas, dory. We can tame them all. But no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame the Think about this for a moment. Like, you ever been to a circus? Who's all been to a circus? Been to a circus? Isn't it amazing how they can control these animals? I mean, like an elephant, a lion, the apex predator. That literally at one moment could just be like, you know what, I'm done with this. <laughs> I'm eating all y'all. <laughs> and, yet, and yet these guys can tame lions, whales, dolphins, 
The craziest things. And yet, and yet scripture tells us, hey, I know you think you're really, really good at taming all those wild animals. There's one thing that you can't tame. And that is this. Because it's restless and it's evil and it's full of deadly poison. So, yet again, I don't really have to preach this because you, you've experienced this. You know this. You, you, whether that's been something that you've wrestled with yourself or maybe you've had it happen to you. Um, but this is a small thing, a tiny spark that no one can tame and it can do such destructive damage. Alfred Noble was the man who invented the dynamite. Um, and he invented dynamite so he could clear debris, clear rocks, clear a path because they were, they were building roadways and bridges for our nation. And so he tried to figure out, man, how can we clear this path a whole lot quicker than we've ever cleared it? And so he invented dynamite that literally would go in, you know, blow these areas up and create tunnels and create all this stuff. Well, the U.S. government got a hold of this and started realizing we could use this same stuff to create um, destruction against our enemies. And so the U.S. government started taking this dynamite, the same dynamite that was used for construction and was using it for destruction. And, and when Alfred Noble found out about it, he was so distraught because he had always meant for this to be a, a, a thing of blessing, a thing to help, not a thing to ever hurt or kill people. To the point, you can go read this and research this yourself, he was so distraught, he didn't want his legacy to be defined by the dynamite, so he gave his entire inheritance to go and create the Nobel Peace Prize. So today, as you know, every year someone gets elected for this because he wanted to make sure that his legacy was about construction, not destruction. Here's the question. How many know in the hands of the enemy, our tongues can be destruction, but in the hands of God, they can be construction? God's desire has always been for construction, never destruction. And so, I, so here's the bad news. You can't tame your tongue. However much you try, like, I ain't going to say it again. You say it again. I ain't going to do this. You do it again. So that's the bad news. The good news is the spirit of God can control your tongue. So as long as you are a person that's relying on the spirit of God, yeah, he can do some incredible things. And so... Let's, let's dive in today because I, I want today to not just be informational, I want it to be incredibly practical and I, and I pray that a revelation hits for so many of you today in the area of your word. So how can we win in our words? So let me give you three. All right, here's the first one. Understand your differences. Understand your differences. All right, I'm about to divide this room because in this room there's two sets of people. You're either one or the other. We're about to divide it and you're about to figure out who you are. So the first set of people is what I like to call the stewards, the stewards. So here are the stewards. The stewards are those who, um, when something happens, they, they have like slow, they're like a slow boil, just slowly taking things in. Not only do they have a slow boil, they, they are, they keep score and they take notes. They're, they're, they're keeping track of everything that you said, everything that you did, everything that you didn't do. They keep in track of it. Okay, and they are some incredible historians because when you finally get in a place where they go off, they're gonna go back at least 25 years and go, in 2001, on January 15th, you, re you forgot our anniversary, and let me tell you what, I'm, come on, they gonna, and then they're gonna be like, and then in 2007, and then in 2012, and then these are historians. They, 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 they don't say a lot. Okay, listen, it's not that they don't have a lot to say. They've got opinions. They just keep them to themselves for a little while, just to store it up, store it up, store it up. They, they're passive aggressive, so, so when, they're, when they're kind of feeling it, they may not say it out loud, but they'll take little jabs here and there. Oh, I'm glad you showed up for dinner, that's good. Glad. Uh -huh. Oh, you fold your clothes, oh, finally, good job. All right, let go. Good. Like, it's just passive aggressive stuff, right? I know this doesn't happen in y'all's home, I'm talking about my home, okay, this is my home, all right? And, and, and then they withdraw. So when it gets, when it gets intense, they, they back away. They get out. They, I, I'm done. I'm done. They shut down. They're, they're, I'm, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And they, they, they back away, okay? There's, there's those people in here, okay? 
So that's, that's, that's part of y'all. That's some of y'all. Let's go to the other half of y'all. The other half of y'all is what we like to call the spewers. And you're going to notice they are the opposite of the stewers. So they, they don't do slow boil. They go from hot to cold very fast. This is the type of people you hear they got a short fuse. Okay, these are short fuse people, all right? They, and by the way, these are people who all have an opinion and feel like you need to know it. They're going to make sure you know what they're thinking in their life. So they go from cold to cold. To, to hot very fast, okay? The stewards keep score and take notes. The spewers, they'll argue their case until they are blue in the face. And they, they, it's all about escalating. It's all about winning the argument. It's all about letting you know everything that they're thinking, everything that they're feeling. I mean, this is who they are. And, and if they're passive aggressive, spewers are aggressive aggressive. <laughs> they like, they, they, they come in for you. And, and the, the stewards will walk away. The spewers will chase you. Oh, we're going to talk about this. Listen, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. All right, I, I got something to say, and we're going to talk. Okay, all right, here we go. So join us online. If you're online, you can tell us which one. If you're here in the room, stewards, raise your hand. If you're a steward, if you're a steward online, just chat. Steward. Come on, raise it up. Raise it up, raise it up so I know who we're talking to. Okay, okay, okay. This, this is me, by the way. That's me. All right, spewers. All right, all the spewers, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of y'all, your marriage was two, a steward and a spewer? Anybody? Who, who's their stewards and spewers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's Lindsay and I right there. I'm the steward, Lindsay's the spewer. Can ask all of our boys. All right? Yeah. She is, if she's thinking it, she's letting you know. All right? If I'm thinking it, I may let you know. Later. All right? Like, uh, she wants to talk about it. She wants to talk about it right now. We're having the conversation, right? This is it. We're having it right now, okay? And I'm processing, I'm processing. I'm, I'm inwardly processing. She's verbally processing, okay? Now, here's what I want to say this. Neither way are right or wrong. They're just different, okay? So, so Lindsay will tell me all the time, okay? Literally had this conversation this week. This, this week. I'll share more about this in just a moment. But she... She would tell me, and she's told me this countless times, just because you're yelling doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I feel right. <laughs> Why are you yelling? Why are you yelling? Why, what, what's going on? She's like, just because you're yelling, not yelling, doesn't mean you're right. And she's right. It's, it's not. Um, but this is, this is the dynamic in communication. If you got two spewers, woo! They, someone's just trying to be over the other one. It's just about volume. If you got two stewards, nobody want to talk about anything. But everybody's bitter and hates each other. But then you look at me like, hey. <laughs> I hate them. I hate them. Huh? Okay, that's stewards right there. All right? Avoid confrontation like the plague. Like, don't talk about it in your marriage. You got legitimate issues. You don't talk. Okay, then you've got the talker. I mean, so these, so you gotta, you, if you wanna win in this, you gotta understand differences, okay? Now look what, look what Proverbs 21 says. Let's go to scripture here, all right? Some of y'all, this needs to get plastered somewhere in your life, around you, in your home, your bathroom, your car. Watch your words and hold your tongue. Hold, hold it. And some of you may need to physically hold it. I, 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 would love for, I would love to get a photo of this. Someone is in the middle of the argument and you just do this, huh? Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm, I'm not doing that, uh-uh. Some of you may need to do that. If the Holy Spirit can't do it, you do it, okay? Because here's why. You're gonna save yourself a lot of grief. A lot of grief. All right, let me modernize this to 2023. Watch your words. And hold your thumbs. Hold your thumbs. Oh, he's going. Oh. Listen, there are stupid people on the internet. Don't join in and be it. I got to let them know. Someone's got to tell them. No, listen, everybody knows. You don't need to tell them. You don't. 
Let me, let me, let me take it up another step, okay? Here's, here's another tip. Please don't have intense argument conversations via text. Some of you have made some of the worst decisions because you had no control over your thumbs and you text. If people would screenshot it and ever put that on this screen right here, you'd be embarrassed. And by the way, some people do screenshot it and share it. So you need to be, listen, if you're going to have a conversation with someone and it gets intense and there's argument or there's something, pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Hey, I, I sense that we're, you're mad about this. I, hey, I, like, so yet again, like I said, this happened this week. Here's the humor of God. As I'm writing this message, Lindsay and I have a fight. I'm like, right, I'm like getting the scriptures. Proverbs 21, hold your tongue. And Lindsay and I are in intense conversations. And Lindsay's like, uh, she, she comes into my office and there's just, she's upset about a situation that's going on. And I look at her and I was like, you want to talk about it? She's like, I'm too mad to talk. And she walked away. Now listen, my wife's a spewer. If she said, I'm not talking, so I'm drunk. <laughs> and so she's like, I'm leaving. And uh, she had an appointment that she wasn't leaving me. Okay, just want to make sure everything's <laughs> Is that why she's not here? No, she's, she's at a conference in Texas. Okay, we're good. All right, so. But she had, to, she had an appointment in Lafayette. And so I'm sitting in my office, praying over the message. Man, this is a good message. Mm. And I'm like, I need, to, I need to have this conversation. Now, most people would just start texting things. But this wasn't a text conversation. So I pick up the phone. Hey, babe. She's like, hey. Where, where are you at? Drive, driving lap, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you good? You good? No, I'm not good. You want to talk about it? No, because I'm going to cry. Uh, okay. I said, uh, all right, well, then I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for, so I just started sharing all the stuff that I'm sorry for and didn't handle that situation right. Hey, please, please forgive me. And it's amazing, though, when you just say some of those words, how it de-escalates everything. Yeah, babe, I'm sorry, too. Let me, let me tell you. And so then she started talking and crying. <laughs> I told you I didn't want to talk. I'm crying on the phone. I'm going to get my hair done. <laughs> and, uh, and within five, eight minutes, we were good. And we were fine. All was well. It was something so small, which, by the way, most arguments are. It's usually not major stuff. It's just small, stupid stuff. Oftentimes, because we're so different, too, we see things so differently. I got my opinion. She's got hers. And I, in that moment, I'm just realizing, like, more and more, like, ah, oh, God, I need to have more of these conversations. However hard that conversation is, it's one of the most healing things to do for relationships. Just even over the past couple of, of weeks, I've just had such hard and healing conversations. And we're avoiders of that. Ah, oh, it's no big deal. Yeah, it is, because you keep talking about it. It's a big deal. Pick up the phone. Hey, I, I saw you at church. Are we okay? Hey, is there, any, is there something I did? Is there, and, then, and then let them talk. We're, we're different. We're stewards. We're spewers, right? We're all, we're all different. It's not, it's not wrong. It's just different. But we've got to learn to communicate. We've got to learn to humble ourselves. We've got to learn to hold our tongue. We've got to learn to hold our thumbs. We've got to, it, it's, it's better to be considered a fool than to open up your mouth and prove that they're right. So don't prove people right. Sometimes silence is an answer. And so let me give you a practical tip here, okay? Here's a practical tip for the stewers and a practical tip for the spewers. Let me talk to all the stewers in the house, okay? All those that raise your hand that are stewards, if you're online, here's a practical tip. If you're a steward, have the courage to say more when you want to walk away. Have the courage to say more. You're the one 
that if your spouse knows you're a stewer, they'll ride all over you if they're a spewer. And you need to, at some point, be able to say, we've got to talk. We've got to talk. And you need to have some courage. Don't shy away from it. Now, if you need to collect yourself, get yourself together, that's one thing. But let me share what Scripture tells us. Ready? Scripture tells us in Ephesians 4, it says this, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give, and here's what happens. When you let the sun go down on your anger, you're giving an opportunity to the devil. This word opportunity right here literally means room. Here's, here's what it means. When I let the sun go down on my anger, I'm literally opening the door of my heart and saying, come live in here. Here's a room for you. Hey, listen, I don't know about y'all. Life's hard enough. I don't need to give the enemy more access to my heart and my life, especially my home. And so Lindsay and I, we, that is one thing that we, we are very big on, which is we are not going to bed angry. Now listen, we may stay up till 3 a.m., but we're not going to bed angry. Like, we're not doing this. Because most people are like, ah, I'm just gonna sleep on it, it's, it's no big deal. But well, here's the problem, you wake up tomorrow and it's still there. It's still there, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And so for stewards in here, just make a commitment. I'm not gonna go to bed with there being issues here. Like, we're gonna, we're gonna talk it out. Now, we may have to talk it out more over the coming days, but we're gonna make sure that we talk this out. We gotta talk it out. I can't tell you how many times Lindsay and I have had, have had intensive conversations around things that aren't even really about us. It may be stuff that's happening in the church. It may be stuff that's happening in our boy's life. It may be stuff that's happening in other people's life. And we'll literally look at each other and go, same team, same team. And what that means is, why are we letting their drama get in us? We're on the same team. I'm not going against you. You're not going against me. Listen, we should be going against the world, <laughs> not letting the world get in here. Everybody with me? Okay, so listen, for stewards, step up and speak up. Now, for the spewers, all right, here's yours. Have self-control to say less when you want to be dominated by your feelings. We know you got an opinion. Everybody knows you've got an opinion. And everybody knows when you get your feelings hurt or you're up in your feels that you want to say everything that you're thinking and feeling. Listen, here's wisdom. Don't have self-control to, to hold back. Listen, by the way, it's a fruit of the Spirit to hold back and go, maybe I need to listen. Because if spewers, if you're not careful, you'll dominate the conversations. And you'll dominate your spouse or you'll dominate your kids, or you'll dominate a workplace because that's just your personality. But, but you need to be able to, to say, oh, hold on, you know, maybe, I should, maybe I should ask more questions. Maybe I should do what James tells us. Look what, look what James says it this way. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. All right, all the spewers, say this with me. You must be. <laughs> all this, oh, y'all don't wanna talk now? Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. You must be what? Quick to listen. And, and quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry. Notice, notice how this goes. Watch this. Because when I'm, when I'm not quick to listen and I'm quick to talk and I'm quick to speak, guess what? I'm also quick to get angry. If I want to get slow and angry, I've got to get slow in talking. So I need to listen. How many of y'all have ever had this happen? Let me just get a show of hands in here. How many of y'all have ever had this happen? Somebody's talking and you interrupt in the middle because you think you already know where they're going and you jump to conclusions before they do and they say something like this. Would you let me finish? <laughs> Come on. Let, hey, listen. Everybody else, y'all can polish your halos, but listen, for us real people in here, <laughs> would you let me finish? Meaning, here's what that means. Can I be heard? Because when you don't listen to people, we'll talk about this in just a minute a little bit more, but when you don't listen to people, they're not being heard. When they're not being heard, they're not being validated. When they're not being validated, they don't feel loved. I've had to, I've had to work on this myself immensely, immensely. And so, so we've got to allow this. And, and, and then let me say it this way. You can't control what people do or say, but you can control how you respond. You can control how you respond. And, and, and here's really honestly the biggest thing out of all this. 
You can't unring that bell. Once that comes out, anybody had something come out and you're like, no. <laughs> like as soon as it came out, you're like, I should not have said that. Anybody? Okay, all right, yeah. Countless times. If I would have just probably paused for five seconds, I would have saved myself whew, some pain. So sometimes just patience, just be, you know what, let me be quick to listen here. And let me tell you where the hardest place I find that this is for me in parenting. Because I'm the parent. So you listen to what I say. But that makes your children not feel heard, feel valued. Right, man, I'm learning this in real time right now. I have three teenagers. Man, uh, maybe I should stop and just listen. Maybe, it, maybe because I said so is not always the best answer. Maybe I need to take it in a little bit. All right? So, so we need to realize our differences. Number two, you need to realize that your words are fruit. Every word that you speak is going to bear fruit, and every word that you're going to consume is fruit. It's fruit. This is what scripture says, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Let me say this, though. Those who don't even love it will eat its fruit. Here's the deal. Is the fruit that you're eating from the words that you're speaking, are they bitter or sweet? Some of us are eating some bitter fruit. So do you like what you're eating? Because every word that you speak is also seeds, and they're planting trees. And we're bearing the fruit of seeds that we've planted. And here's, here's what I'm learning yet again. Listen, I'm inviting you all into my, my world of learning. Sometimes you'll say something in one season and not bear it until another season. Sometimes you'll speak one thing over your spouse or over your kids and it doesn't seem like it did any damage and then a years later you realize that was a defining moment for them. In the good and in the bad. And so for us just to realize like every time I'm speaking, there, there's fruit, there's, there's words that are coming out that are fruit and if you go, well, I, how do I know what kind of fruit I'm bearing? Well, let's read what Matthew 12, 34 says. For whatever is in your heart determines what you, whatever's in your heart determines what you say. Now think about this. Think about how incredible this is as a gift from God. That if you want to know how your heart's doing, just listen to what your words are saying. Pastor Josh, how do I know how I'm doing? Just listen to what you say. Because the Bible says out of the, Another translation of this is out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, so what an incredible gauge thermometer of how your heart is. Just listen to what you're saying. Is, is everything that you're saying critical, complaining, negative, down, vulgar, abusive, put downs? Then, then that is an indicator of how your heart is. And so the Bible says that, that, that you can't have a wellspring that's good and bad, that's good and bitter. Like, there's got to be a heart transformation that happens. And so, so, so here's, here's something I want you to, to realize. When you don't like what's coming out of your, of your mouth, ask God to show you what's in your heart. Because you don't need mouth transformation, you need heart transformation. If you have a hard time swearing, it's not you got a mouth issue, you got a heart issue. You got a heart issue. I was literally at my son, my son who's 13, my youngest son, I was at his baseball game uh, the other day, and literally as, as, as a kid got on, on his team, swung the bat, struck out, and as he was walking to the dugout, the words that were coming out of his mouth, if he would have been my child, so I grabbed, I grabbed him very gently, brought him over here, and I said, look at me. 
I said, the words that are coming out of your mouth reveal a whole lot about you. And you don't have to use any of those words to express how you feel. I know you're frustrated. I know. I know you are. But listen, all that stuff that's coming out, you don't have to say those things. Listen, and it don't make you cool. It makes you look pretty foolish. And you're a wise kid. And so listen, in this environment, we're going to be encouraging. We're not going to be discouraging. And we're not going to blank this to them players and blank this to them. And just had that little. Now, here's the, here's the crazy part of it. Ready? So I had that conversation, and then Lindsay, <laughs> Lindsay told me, well, his parents do it right in front of him, and he does it right in front of his parents. I'm like, ah. Mm. Now I figured it out. Now I figured it out. This is, this is an indication of our heart, of our heart. But how many know you don't have to be vulgar to have a hard heart, too? So it's, it bears this fruit, which goes to number three, which is that we've got to speak life in your home. If you want to win in this, you got to know it's fruit. You got to understand the differences, but you got to speak life in your home. How many all know when God made the heavens and the earth and the trees and the mountains and the whales and the fish and everything else, what, how did he do it? He said it. He spoke it into existence. We have a God who speaks things into existence. And that same spirit that lives inside of you is the same spirit that resided in Jesus. And how many know if he could speak things into existence, we can speak things into existence. We can shift an atmosphere. We can shift a culture. How many of y'all have ever been in your home and there's one person that's got an attitude, they're complaining, and it changes the whole home? The whole dynamic of the house is all jacked up now because you got one complainer that's in the house. Right? Anybody have that? Maybe it's been you. Maybe you've been the complainer. I know I've done that. I know I've walked into my house and not always had the best attitude, just shift everything. Everybody was all happy, and then I showed up with my stank face and just changed everything up. Right? Just as much, watch this though, just as much as one person can shift the whole atmosphere to make it negative, one person can walk into an incredibly toxic culture and shift the atmosphere too. You can go into this place and be a place of faith, a place of blessing, a place of hope, a place of encouragement, a place of joy. You can be that. You can totally be that. But you gotta make a decision to do that. So you've gotta speak life. What does it mean to speak life? It means speaking God's word and God's perspective into every single situation. Speaking God's word, speaking God's perspective. So Ephesians chapter five. All right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna gonna speak to the husbands real quick here, speak to the wives real quick here, then I'll speak to all of us. Husbands. This is what scripture says about your words. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wife, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not by getting. Here we go. His words evoke her beauty. His words evoke her beauty. His words. If I ever wanna know how a husband's doing, I just look at the wife. Because if the wife is radiant, beautiful, and I'm not talking about exteriorly beautiful. I'm talking about just carries herself in a way that's, just holds her head up. I go, that, that must be a husband that speaks into that. And when I see women that are always like this, always discouraged, always depressed, it's probably a husband who's absent in that. And I tell you, that's a challenge to me as well over my wife. Speaking life over her. Because everything that a husband does and everything that a husband says is designed to bring out the best in her. And husbands, I pray that this is a check right here. How am I doing in this? How am I doing in this? Your job, according to this verse, is to lay down your life. She is the job. Your wife is the job. Before the career, before the ambitions, before the hobbies, and before church, your wife is the job. When you said, I do, you were saying, I will. I will. And for us to all in here hear this, your marriage will never rise above the level of your mouth. It's important for us to be men who speak life. Speak life, speak life. Listen. And I've failed in this often. I'm not perfect in this myself, but I'm challenging us as men to speak that. Now, to the women. 
You didn't think I was only going after the men, did you? All right. <laughs> here we go. I don't even know if I want to go here. I'm going I'm to hide behind here. A, na a nagging wife is like the drip, drip, drip of a leaky faucet. You can't turn it off and you can't get away from it. No, don't you amen. No, uh -uh. mm. no, 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 you don't, you don't amen right here. This is, mm. you say, oh me, that's what you say, okay? All right, so, so ladies, listen, listen. Are you being an encouragement to your husband? He ain't perfect, I know that. I know that. He got problems, he got issues, he won't talk about nothing. I know, I know. But, but, but are you life-giving? Are you encouraging? Are you reminding him of what you're thankful for? Or are you just continually reminding him of what he's not doing? Are you reminding him of who he is? And yet again, not what he's not. Because yet again, a husband will rise to the level of what his wife speaks of him. Hey, by the way, so will your children. Oh, I'm raising these little hellions. Well, guess what they're going to be? You just spoke it into existence. Okay? So we need to be mindful of this. And so I, I, I just wrote this down. What would, what would happen in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships if we spoke life? What would happen if we grabbed our kids and said, I love you, I'm proud of you. Hey, listen, someone's always speaking to your kids. Always. Y'all go watch that Dove commercial? Anybody go watch it? Y'all saw it? That's a culture that's speaking to your children and shaping their world. They're being discipled. We get to disciple our children with our words, with our words. And so I, I, I'm gonna tell you uh, yet again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to live out of a place of transparency here. I got challenged this week by the Lord. The Lord straight up convict me. And I had to, I, man, there's such a deep repentance that I had to do. And, and here, was the, here was the challenge. The Lord said, would you encourage more than critique? Would you encourage, would you give life? Specifically in my area of, of parenting, how I many know when you go through seasons where there's a high correction season? It's hard. But to speak what you see, to speak what you're doing, speak, it, speak this. Speak it out. Speak it out. If Jesus could, could create this world with his words, if he could raise, de raise the dead from his words, how I many know we have the same power to do it as well? So how do we do this practically? Listen before you speak. Listen before you speak. Scripture tells us answering before listening is both stupid and rude. So we need to be people who listen. And let, let, me, let me just say this, this needs to be said because I think this is gonna happen coming out of this, this message. Some of you right now have been so challenged today. Those who are doers, I challenge you to speak up. Those who are spewers, I challenge you to, to hold back. Some of you, you're gonna have someone come to you and go, we need to talk. We need to have a conversation. And everything inside of you is gonna wanna defend yourself, justify your actions, and make it seem like that other person is all wrong. And if your spouse comes to you and says, we need to talk about something, and you're that way, and you're not a safe place, and you blow up, and you point fingers, and you cast blame, they'll never talk to you again. You got to create a safe place to go. I hear you, babe. You're right. Even if you were 2% wrong, own it. And I've realized in my own marriage the importance of creating a safe place for my wife who is a spewer to say everything that she says that's on her heart. Do I always wanna hear it? No. Does she need to say it? Yes. 
And so it's, it's, it's creating environments for our spouses. For some, for some of us, it's creating an environment for our children to come to us and go, I need to share something that's on my heart, but I feel like if I share it, I'm going to get in trouble. This is a safe place. Share it. What, what's, what's on your heart? What's going on? I'm telling you, these words, these are, these are huge here. So we want to be a people who are listening. Listening. Quick to listen. Number two, think before you speak. I'm not just listening, but I'm thinking. What, here's, here's some things. Ephesians 4, 29, we've got to wrap up. It says this, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let it be good and helpful. Good and helpful. Now, sometimes hard conversations don't feel good and they don't feel like they're helping, but they are. They are. And, 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 and so let me give you three questions to ask before you say something. If you need to filter it, let me give you three things quickly. Should this be said? How should this be said? When should this be said? Maturity is knowing all the answers to all of these. Should I even say this? Maybe I shouldn't even say it, so I'm just gonna hold my tongue. I'm not gonna say anything. Maybe I need to speak up, because I have been holding my tongue and I need to speak up. And then how should I say this? Because scripture is very big on how you say things, with truth and grace. May your speech be seasoned with salt. May you do it in an act of love. May you do it lovingly. Okay, we need to make sure that our tone is right and how we do it. But then we need to go, when should we say this? When your husband walks into the door, might not be the best time to go. (laughs) Welcome home, baby, welcome home. Like figuring out the right timing to have conversations, but you need to have them. You need to have them. All right, and then lastly, pray before you speak. Pray before you speak. Psalms 19, 14, here's a great prayer. If you're looking for a great prayer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing, watch this, be pleasing to you. So, so here's a, if you want to add a fourth, fourth question to those three questions, here's a good fourth one. God, are you happy with what I'm about to say? Because I'm about to say something. And I want to make sure that, God, you're happy with what I'm about to say. They might not be happy. But God, as long as I'm honoring you and how I'm saying it, what I'm saying, that's, that's what matters to me. Okay, now I want us, I want us to do this because this is a response. All right, put your binders away just for a moment. Just put all your stuff right there. I want you to close your eyes and, and, and not really for anything spiritual other than just let this just be a moment. Can we just make this just a quick moment? Go ahead, everybody. Do your binders real quick. Everybody. Okay, same time, y'all. Let's go. All right. Um. Here's how I've been praying for this. Because I've done a lot of counseling in our church and I've talked with a lot of families in our church. I know that there's many of you in this room that as I'm talking about this, this strikes a nerve. Either because you were the one who was verbal and you've hurt some people with your words or you were the receiver of that and, and hurtful words were said to you. And, and, and there's, some, there's some pain there. There's some pain. And, and my prayer has been for those that are in this room that have experienced word pain, that, they, that today would be some deep healing. My prayer has been for those of you that have had an uncontrolled tongue that the Holy Spirit would convict you. That you would do that first verse and you would take your words seriously, realizing how powerful they are. And if you have hurt someone with your words, that this is a safe place and a safe moment for there to be repentance, for there to be confession. Yet again, think about it. When God wants to bring healing, he asks us to confess 
That's words. I need to say it out loud, okay? I understand after this message, there's gonna be maybe some very uncomfortable conversations that go forth from here. Some spouses in here are going to have the courage and confidence to step up and say, I need to have this conversation with my, my spouse. And I wanna pray for you. Some of you maybe with your children, a boss, a coworker. But I, I just pray that the spirit of God would be here in this moment. And if you've been allowing the enemy to have a room in your heart, I pray today is the eviction notice that we say, enemy, you no longer welcome here. You're no longer welcome here. So if any of that is you right now, you say, I, I, I know the Holy Spirit, man, he's, he's speaking to me right now. If that's you and you wanna see some healing, whether words spoken over you, whether words that you have spoken, you just wanna see God do some healing in your heart and in those around you, would you stand? Would you stand if that's you? Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. greatest words that we need to hear are the words of the Holy Spirit today. It's not my words, it's his words. So Holy Spirit, will you speak? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. If you're here and you need, to, you need to repent and confess of some things that maybe you have said that has been hurtful or harmful, would you just right here in this moment between you and the Lord, would you just begin to say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the words that I've said that have grieved your heart. God, I'm sorry for the words that I've said that have hurt people around me. God, would you forgive me? Which by the way, he does. He does, he has, he already has. Such grace here for you. But now would you just ask God, would, would, would you heal? Would you heal my heart? Out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth speaks. So God, would you heal? Would you heal my heart? Some of you, there's been words that have been spoken over you, or maybe there was never these words that you long for ever spoken of you. And I'm praying for deep healing right now. God, heal your heart. I thank you, Lord, that your word, your word would penetrate them. They would hear from you, I'm proud of you. I love you. I value you. I forgive you. I'm with you. God, I thank you today, Lord, that you're speaking to your people. So Lord, I pray for those that are in this room that they, maybe they've gotta go have a conversation now. God, as they leave this room now, Lord, Lord they've, they've gotta go have uncomfortable conversations, heartfelt conversations. I pray, Lord, for courage. I pray, Lord, that those that are on the receiving end would be responsive and, and humble. God, I, I pray, Lord, that there would just be deep healing. Even right now, God, healing in marriages healing in families, healing between parents and children. God, healings in workplaces, Lord, just deep healing, that what the enemy meant to divide with words, that you would bring healing with words, restoration, reconciliation. Lord, may we be people who speak life. Thank you that you speak your life over us today. Lord, we accept that. We thank you for it. Lord, I pray, God, just that you would do your deep work today in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen.